cake. I didn't know there were any cakes. That's free.
So good evening. Uh, welcome tonight to the John F. Kennedy School of Government Forum at Harvard. I'm Graham Allison, Douglas Dillon Professor of Government and Director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. Joe McCarthy, the school's uh, Senior Associate Dean for Students, likes to say that the forum is the Kennedy School student's sixth course. And I certainly agree. Uh, when I counsel my advisees, I say to take full advantage of, uh, of these events. And tonight we've got a prime example of where we have an extraordinarily well-qualified panel to help us, to help educate us on a particularly important topic. Atop the central challenges for American foreign policy today stands Iran. Unfortunately, most Americans, including many American foreign policymakers, don't know very much about Iran. So let me start you off with a quiz, okay? So uh, this is for the audience, not for the panel. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds to write down your answers to these questions. First, how many nations border Iran? And can you name the nations? There's a British wag who likes to uh, uh, say that Americans learn geography by fighting wars. Okay. Uh, so can you do better? Uh, secondly, what's the difference between a Sunni and a Shiite? Uh, there's a Washington reporter, Jeff Stein, whom some of you have seen his piece. He's at the uh, National Journal. And he goes around Washington in a Borat style asking people, uh, can you tell the difference between a Sunni and a Shiite? Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, uh, he went to the new head of the new national security branch of the FBI and asked him, and he reports this now in the Post, uh, whether it was important for a man in his position to know the difference between a Sunni and a Shiite. Yes, sure. It's right to know the difference. It's important to know who your targets are. <laughs> okay. So he asked them, and, uh, well, could you explain to me then how, how do we tell the difference between Sunnis and Shiites? And he says, quote, the basics go back to their beliefs and who they're willing to follow and the conflicts between Sunnis and Shiites and the differences in who they were. So trying to help him, the reporter says, which one is Iran? You know, Sunni or Shiite? He thought for a minute and he said, Iran and Hezbollah, which are they? So now here's the FBI guy. Sunni, he says. So the reporter says, wrong. And so the reporter says, well, how about Al-Qaeda? He says, Sunni. Okay, so he got that one right. He then goes to the new head of the intelligence committee in the Congress. No, this is, I'm just reading what he says. And he asked the new head, he says to him, what about Sunnis and Shiite? And he answers, Al-Qaeda is what I asked, Sunni or Shiite? Al-Qaeda, they have both, Mr. Ray said. You're talking about predominantly? Yeah. Sure, I said, okay. Not knowing what else to say. Predominantly, he says, predominantly Shiite. That's for Al-Qaeda. Answer wrong, okay. So Sunni and Shiite, how do you tell the difference? Okay, finally, uh, what's the chances of a uh, US or Israeli uh, military attack on Iran before the end of the Bush administration? Now, before we get to the uh, end of the panel, you will have learned the answers to, uh, to all these questions. Uh, actually, you can put up the map now and that'll give people a little bit of clues. You probably can't read it that closely, so I, I don't know who will have got the prize for the right number of nations. Um, but to help us ex explore these topics tonight, we've got a terrific panel. Uh, David Ignatius is the lead Washington Post foreign policy columnist and somebody who's been drilling down on Iran and the Middle East for many years, most recently interviewing on these topics, among others, President Bush, Secretary of State Rice, Iranian President Ahmadinejad, and Iran's chief nuclear negotiator, Mr. Laranjani. Uh, I'm going to save Steve Miller to last because he's playing a special role here tonight and go to a next of our guests, Valley Nasser, 
Valley is a fellow in the Dubai Initiative here at the Belfer Center at the Kennedy School, but he's a professor at the Naval Postgraduate School, and he's the author of what I think is the best book if you're trying to learn about uh, Shiite, which is called The Shiite Revival, How Conflicts Within Iran Will Shape the Future. Ray Take is a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and also someone who's been studying this arena carefully for a long time. And I would recommend with enthusiasm for those of you who are trying to learn something about Iran, his book entitled Hidden Iran, Paradox and Power in the Islamic Republic. And finally, last and certainly not least, is our own Steve Miller. Steve is the director of the International Security Program at the Belfer Center here at the Kennedy School. But Steve has been to Iran a number of times in the last couple of years and has been trying to understand things from an Iranian perspective. So in my class, when I did a, 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 a case uh, recently, last week, on blocking Iran's nuclear ambitions, I brought Steve to class for the second of the two classes uh, and made him role play as if he was Mullah Miller, uh, looking at things from the perspective of a rational Iranian advisor to the supreme leader. And he did such a persuasive job that I think by the end of the class, most of the students were more sympathetic to the Iranian perspective than they were to the one that I had tried to present. So our format tonight is going to go this way. Uh, initially, we're going to have a conversation here at the panel, uh, Davos style, in which I'll put some questions and we'll try to drill down. I'm, the, the topic tonight is U.S.-Iranian relations, is conflict inevitable? Okay. So that's what we're talking about. I'm going to look at three dimensions, three potential dimensions of conflict. First, the nuclear. Uh, if you said, why is Iran at the top of the U.S. Uh, foreign policy agenda today? Two words, nuclear weapons. There's many reasons to be interested in Iran, but there's two reasons why it's at the top of the agenda. Um, second, Iraq. Uh, in the State of the Union and thereafter, the Bush administration has begun talking about Iran's role in Iraq. So I'd be very interested in the panel's views of what role and what interests Iran has in Iraq and in developments in Iraq. And then thirdly, we'll try to broaden the conversation, if we have time, to the larger issue of the national interests of both Iran and the United States. Are these two nations that are destined to be adversaries, given their real interests? That's hypothesis one. Or actually are they, in terms of their real interests, more aligned than they may recognize? Certainly a view that's been expressed by some of our panelists. So we've got good topics here to explore. We'll then... Uh, go to the audience, and so you'll have an opportunity to put your own, own questions. And uh, I've said to the panelists, if they've got any other important points they want to make in the context of the question, is conflict, uh, particularly armed conflict, inevitable in this relationship, we'll give them a chance to say so. So let me start us off quickly on the nuclear program, uh, the nuclear issue. So if you go to uh, a popular uh, website, I'm not going to refer you to it since I don't, don't want to encourage you to be involved in betting, but nonetheless, if you go to a popular website and ask the question, what's the chance of a US or Israeli military attack on Iran before the end of 2007, this year? Answer, 21%. So you can go and place a bet at the rate of 21%. So what I'd say to the panelists initially, and maybe just go quickly through, if you take it not just the end of 2007, but uh, the end of the, uh, of the Bush presidency, so January 2009, is 21% as odds for a US or Israeli military attack on Iran's nuclear facilities too high, too low, or about right? What would you say, Dave? Um. Graham, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's probably about right. Um, Graham Allison is the person who described the Iran uh, nuclear issue as the Cuban Missile Crisis in slow motion. And so I wonder, Graham, what somebody would have said 
you know, in the early days of the Cuban Missile Crisis was the chance that the U.S. and the Soviet Union would end up in nuclear war. It's a, it's a similar kind of question. Um, what makes this difficult for me to, to answer is that you've included Israel um, as one of the potential um, combatants, and it's, it's harder for me because I, I'm not in Israel uh, to, to assess the likelihood of, of an Israeli attack. Um, I'd say two brief things. Uh, the first is whatever the chance is, whatever that percentage number is, um, it, and it's certainly to me less than 50 percent, more than 10 percent, it's, it's a fraction less um, today than it was yesterday for one simple reason. The Iranians agreed this afternoon that they would send a representative to this regional conference that will take place in Baghdad this weekend at which U.S. and Iranian representatives will sit down around the same table together uh, for the first time in some years to talk about Iraq. So I think that's a, a tiny but, but, but real confidence building measure. The second thing I'd say is that um, to me the, the, the risk of war is, is less uh, a deliberate attack by the U.S. I'm going to leave Israel out than it is the miscalculations that could result from having um, large and growing military presence in that area. When you have two aircraft carrier battle groups in the Persian Gulf, um, you know, I'm sure there are members of the Revolutionary Guards who would like to see the United States go to war against Iran so as to draw us deeper into a conflict they believe uh, they will ultimately uh, win in. So it's, there's that kind of miscalculation. Um, you know, there, there are so many points of conflict now that you can imagine things getting out of control that would spiral things up even if there wasn't an intention to start a war. Okay, thank you, David. We're gonna, Steve is gonna be uh, tonight in his role as the uh, advisor to the uh, supreme leader in Iran. So we'll save you for last as a Iranian perspective on these issues and go to Valley. What would you say? Too high, too low, and? I think the uh, chances of Israel going to war with Iran is actually very low, much lower than that. But I think the chances with the U.S. Uh, ending up in a conflict with Iran is higher. And the reason is that both countries have ended up in a foreign policy that assumes that by being tough on the other side, by, by sort of showing a growling, uncompromising face, you bring the other side to the table for a more favorable position. But there's a great chance that either or the other side may, may overreach. In other words, there, there's no boundaries recognized. And uh, in particular, because there is no communication or engagement between them, that possibility is fairly, fairly high. And thirdly, I would say that uh, uh, we talk about the nuclear issue, but in reality, uh, the conflict is more likely to happen in other arenas. In other words, in Lebanon, in Persian Gulf, or in Iraq. And the chances now of an accidental conflict escalating is more. In other words, I think probably Iran and the US, uh, to take a different uh, historical example than the Cuban Missile Crisis, are in a situation like Europe in 1914. So there's a chance of a- Like 1914? 1914, of escalation. That was not a good year, yes. Not a good year, that's right. Okay, uh, interesting, interesting, uh, and broadening. Ray, what would you say? Uh, too high, too low, or? First of all, let me parse the question. Please. Uh, because I think David made a very important point about brush fire, fire exchange between the two parties in Iraq, as the American forces have been told to disable and kill Iranian representatives right. and so forth. So I'll leave that aside and deal with the question being American and or Israeli attack on Iran's nuclear facilities. So right. Please. Uh, now I have several bets outstanding on this issue, and I'll say what I said before. I, don't, I think those chances are almost non-existent. And Almost I'll, non-existent. I would say non-existent at all, and I say for about three specific reasons. Uh, first, there's no domestic consensus for the use of force. You have a very skeptical Congress that every day is trying to introduce new resolution prohibiting the president from doing so, and this is a president at very low popularity rating dealing with the problems that he has in Iraq. Second, there's no international consensus. One of the reasons why there is some degree of European assistance for American sanctions policy is to thwart any sort of a resort to military force, and should there be one, that international solidarity will evaporate and not be reconvened. And finally, there's no regional consensus. No. Regional consensus. I realize that every time somebody goes to the Gulf, uh, many members of the princely class whisper in whose ear, saying they're very cautious about Iran and so forth. Uh, but nevertheless, I think in the region, there is no particular appetite for going to war against Iran. So you put all those together, 
I think the administration would be prone to pass this portfolio to its successor with all this complexity. Okay, good. Well, at least we've got the bets out. Uh, and uh, if you're interested, you can uh, come back to this in the topics. L let, me, let me drill a little further on it. Because there's, oh, sorry. Uh, Mula Miller, yes, what would you say? Yeah. If you were in a man today, would you believe uh, that the chance of the US or Israel attacking you is about 21% before the end of the Bush term, or higher or lower? Yeah. Well, with respect to the Americans, uh, after six years, we've got it. The American policy is regime change toward us. And we think that their nuclear policy is a subset of that regime change effort. So it's a pretext. They use it to bully us. Uh, we noticed that several weeks ago, the president, President Bush, was quoted as saying that he would regard it as a personal humiliation if Iran's nuclear program were intact when he left office, and that he would uh, equally regard it as a major strategic setback for the United States. Uh, we think that the uh, Americans take seriously the somewhat hot-headed views of our president, and we have every reason, I think, to take seriously the statements of the American president. Fortunately, he's bogged down in a, in a lot of troubles that may constrain him but we think his impulse is to use force against us. Good. Just to remind you, in case there's any misinterpretation, Steve is role-playing. <laughs> these, these are not his uh, personal views, uh, uh, but I, I think it's, uh, I don't think we're gonna get a strategic uh, uh, thinker from an Iranian perspective that would give us a better account to try to help us look at something through somebody else's uh, eyes. And obviously, people who know Iran a lot better, uh, particularly Ray and uh, Valley and David, if you all have a strong disagreement, just don't, uh, don't, uh, you know, don't, don't, don't hesitate. Let me, let me stay on the nuclear question a little further, though. Last week, the International Atomic Ener Energy Agency, which is the agency that monitors this activity, reported that, quote, Iran has not suspended its enrichment-related activity at Natanz, as it was required to do by the UN Security Council 1737, and demanded that Iran suspend all enrichment activity. The IAEA report also says, by Mohammed al baradei whom we actually had here last year uh, discussing this, uh, that Iran is moving ahead swiftly in installing centrifuges in its underground cavern at Natanz, and could have 3,000 centrifuges functioning by May of 2007, so just now in four months. And a cascade of 3,000 centrifuges that operates continuously for 271 days can produce one bomb's worth of highly enriched uranium. So I'm just giving you the facts. Now, if, this is again to each of you, if, in starting with David, if you, if you found yourself an advisor to President Bush, and he were to ask you, uh, at this fork in the road, uh, as I look at these two options, I can on the one hand attack this facility and prevent it completing a production line that can produce a bomb's worth of plutonium in a year, or alternatively, I can acquiesce and kick this can down the road, which would you advise or other? Um, well, let me do a version of, uh, of, uh, of or other. I mean, I, the first thing to, to note is that it's extremely unlikely from, from what I know, Graham, that um, the Iranians will succeed in operating a 3,000 centrifuge cascade effectively for a week, let alone 271 right. days. Um, so it's last, conceivable that this issue doesn't arise yeah, I mean, until 2009 or 2010. Your, your hypothetical is, is pretty the unlikely. Taking the, the uh, extreme. But it's important yeah. to, to recognize that, that, that I mean, the reason it's unlikely is that, is that from what we know from IAEA inspectors, the Iranians have had um, some significant difficulty 
getting their initial, much smaller cascades working. Um, it, it is said by the IAEA inspectors privately that um, when they inject uh, the uranium into the centrifuges, um, the, the, they tend to overheat and break down, and so they just can't run them continuously. Now, maybe they saw all, all those problems and are really moving to industrial scale production, but there's reason to, to doubt that, so there's, so there's likely to be more, more time. And, you know, the obvious problem with, with bombing um, a facility is you don't know whether there are other facilities in duplicate. Um, and the, the, the consequences for the larger national security picture of the United States of such an action in terms of, um, you know, going deeper into uh, a conflict that's going to make us uh, hated uh, even more than we already are uh, around the world, I, I think outweighs any national security benefit from such an attack. So, you know, if I was um, an advisor, I think that would be at the, at, the, at the top of my list. But I think the main thing I'd want to say is yeah. there's probably more time here than your hypothetical implies. And if, if there were more time, in that time, have you got some thought about what you would propose to you do? Know, I think people talk about the two clocks that are ticking. And the one clock is the nuclear program. When will they achieve the ability to make a bomb, have the material to make a bomb, um, uh, et cetera. And the other clock is a clock about political change, um, which would make Iran a different kind of adversary that, uh, whose possession of any weapon would, would, would make us less, uh, less concerned. And I think that my advice, strongest advice, would be to accelerate in every way we can that second clock by engaging Iran, by greater dialogue, by greater opening to Iran. I really think, we'll talk about this later, but I, mean, I think that, that um, you know, in terms of making the second clock tick faster, um, that's where we need to move aggressively. Okay. Ali, what would you say? I agree, actually, with everything David said, namely that it's very clear that the Iranians had a great deal of difficulty managing 164 centrifuges. And the idea that they can install 3,000 centrifuges, and then there's a huge leap of assumption that they can actually operate it. There is no doubt that the Iranians all along have wanted to indicate a sense of inevitability. In other words, they're past the point of no return, and therefore there is no point in trying to take out the program, and you ought to sit down and talk with them. And I think, uh, in some ways, um, the re what IEA has been saying, in a way, reflects exactly what Iran wants IEA to be telling the world, which is, we've got it. Don't bother sending the rockets or the airplanes. You may as well come to some kind of a understanding with Iran. Secondly, most of our worries are about the, the very first red line we've drawn, which is about mastering enrichment. Uh, the, Iran has to master many other technologies past enrichment before it had actually deliver a bomb to anybody. And uh, that, uh, that means that actually a timeline until a time that Iran can actually be a feasible, feasible nuclear threat is farther out than the timeline that when he can master just enrichment. And uh, thirdly is that uh, uh, the question is that uh, there are two ways of looking at a military attack on Iran. Either you, you lob a certain number of cruise missiles into Iran to get their attention and bring them to the table, or you hit a single facility like Natanz, very well assuming what David is saying is correct, namely that um, uh, there are redundancies. You know that. You know you're not going to get everything, but you hope that the Iranians also would understand that uh, they need to come to the table. Or alternately, you're really serious about taking this program out or pushing it back. And then you're look, looking at a, somewhere between 70 to 1,000 targets before, between who is talking which are deeply embedded under the ground, which require double the amount of time Israel spent in the summer to take out, his, uh, to take out Hezbollah's rockets. That means a month of sustained, systematic carpet bombing of many, many urban as well as industrial facilities in Iran. And then you have to think that you, you cannot look at the nuclear issue in isolation as if it's the only thing in the Middle East we care about, even though it's the top of the agenda, which means that there is, a, this is, this is a, there is a cost to taking Iran's nuclear program out. The cost will be paid everywhere else. The cost will be paid in terms of enormous amount of outrage around the Muslim world if you seriously bomb Iran. The cost will be paid in a regime that will not fall, but then the gloves will come out. It has no benefit in, in behaving anywhere. Uh, the cost will come in the fact that the US has to be prepared to put boots on the ground to follow up an, an air war. 
And the cost will come that actually, if you are actually successful and you do bring this regime down, then you have to deal with the largest country in the Middle East being stateless. And if we, we learn one thing in Afghanistan is that we're threatened more when there is no state than when there is a rogue state. And, and turning Iran as a consequence of, of a military dealing with a nuclear issue into an unstable, large piece of territory without governance uh, is actually going to be a much bigger or, or an equal strategic threat to the United States coming down the road. Okay, Ray, what would you be? I know you and Valley wrote a piece that pretty much was along those lines, but uh, sure. um, you want to add any uh, or I subtract? Both David and Valley have touched on certain aspects of this, namely David talked about the technological problems that Iran's program is having, and Valley talked about the military impracticalities of this. I'll add, I'll say, if I was saying anything to the president, I would say by May, you have a different problem with Iran. The 3,000 centrifuges that are trying to be assembled, they don't have to operate with efficiency. They can be tied together by a rubber band. What the figure is designed to do is introduce a certain irreversible number. What Iranians may do by May, June, whenever they get to these 3,000 non-functioning centrifuges, is at that time, have a modest suspension and go into negotiations, the purpose of those negotiations being to extract American acceptance of facts on the ground. And just as Americans now accepted North Korea having 10 nuclear bombs, the agreement says they'll deal with that at another time. That means half past never. Uh, so in essence, what you do in the negotiations is America accepts Iran having 3,000 centrifuges, and in due course, those centrifuges will operate with efficiency, given Iran the capability of having a nuclear bomb within 18 months or so. So therefore, they'll have the weapons, and they deprive you of the option of using the force. Because once Iranians get to the table, and Secretary Rice has said anywhere, anytime, any place, and the Europeans get on that table, then it's over. Uh, the, you, you have no international coalition to support you because there's a negotiating process on the way. I'll say one more thing in conclusion to Steve's point. When he says the President of the United States says this and that, well, in the past like six, seven years, Steve, the President of the United States has said a lot of things that haven't come true. The transformation of the Middle East, the democratization of Iraq. Uh, so the fact that this President can reverse himself is something that I think you should pay quite close attention to. There's a difference between failure and reversal. <laughs> And what about, Steve, has, has Ray revealed your, uh, your Iranian hand here, that basically what you're doing is setting up the 3,000, even if they're not working, get the Americans to the table, grandfather the 3,000, and then you get your bomb and eat it too? Well, the Americans have this odd conversation about whether they're going to tolerate the centrifuges as if they have some choice in the matter. Uh, this is a, by law and by precedent, this is a legitimate permitted act. There are 19 states that have uh, either commercial or experimental programs and enrichment. Uh, the most recent of which was Brazil, which opened a large commercial scale enrichment facility uh, in the spring of 2006. I didn't hear anybody talking about bombing in Brazil. Uh, our facilities are declared. They're under safeguards. Uh, our current activities are in good standing. Uh, you don't have to take my word for it. You can go to IAEA.org, every one of the Secretary General's reports is a public document that you can download and read. If you download and read them, what you will discover is that over and over and over again in 16 different reports, the IAEA has reported to its Board of Governors that there is no evidence of an Iranian nuclear weapons program. There is no evidence that past undeclared activities were related to a weapons program. There is no evidence of diversion of materials uh, to illicit purposes. Uh, what the IAEA says is that they can't promise that we don't have something hidden somewhere. We're at being asked to prove a negative. This is impossible for us to prove. But uh, we're just going along uh, under Article 4 of the NPT, doing the same thing that any number of other states that have chosen to pursue nuclear uh, power have done. Okay. Uh, well, we've solved the nuclear problem, and now we're moving on to Iraq. Uh, so... Um, an analyst whom I know argues that Iran has the U.S. just where they want us. Bogged down, 
consumed all our bandwidth. No longer talking about regime change in Iran and bleeding influence in the region to Iran's benefit. So, agree or disagree? David? Well, I, that certainly is the way the Iranians uh, view our situation. I, I was in Iran in August and September of last year, and there was a sense of, I, I want to say, triumphalism um, from almost everyone, this, this sense that America is down, we're up, this is our moment that, that we've really arrived. Um, I, I think uh, what's odd about, about this is that Iraq is a place where um, Iranian interests and American interests, in fact, converge. And the Iranians need to be very careful. I mean, you know, the uh, people say it's, you know, it's like the dog chasing the car. So, you know, what happens if, you, if the dog catches the car? What happens? Um, in this case, if, if, if America does leave Iraq suddenly, and what are the consequences of that uh, for Iran? And, and, and I, I think uh, what I'd most like to see come out of the series of meetings that will begin uh, this Saturday in, in Baghdad would be some regular dialogue between the United States and Iraq, Iran about how to stabilize Iraq, how to strengthen this government, which fundamentally is, a, is, a, is an uh, Iran-leaning uh, government, a Shiite government. Um, and I, I think um, since it's so obviously in both countries' interest to encourage that, that um, there, there ought to be small steps that can be taken uh, if people are, are sensible that, that might make the situation um, by the end of the year look, look somewhat different. Okay. Kelly, what would you uh, I, uh, I think D David raises important issues, but let me go back to your question and, in fact, to bring out some of the issues that he raises. The way this question is often posed, particularly in Washington, is to suggest that Iran is actually the, the most negative influence in Iraq and that Iranians don't want stability in Iraq and they don't have a vested interest in stability in Iraq. And I think that's posing the question wrongly because I think, uh, in some ways, uh, the United States, the way the Iraq war happened, uh, and the, the U.S. rhetoric may, made Iraq a threat to Iran. It was supposed to be the stopping post before regime change in Iran. So obviously Iran had every incentive in pursuing a, a, a policy of what we would say controlled chaos in Iraq. In other words, you just want to keep the Americans bogged down to protect yourself. But it also is, uh, is a fact that Iran among uh, Iraq's, all of Iraq's neighbor has been most helpful, helpful at a formal level at least. It's the first government to recognize Iraq. It's the first one to sign a 10 government to government agreements. The volume of trade across, non-oil trade across the borders of the two countries is about a billion dollars a year now. It has provided technical assistance to Iraq's electricity and, and energy sectors and, and the like. And it also is the only country in the region, in, in, around Iraq's neighborhood, that is actually supporting the government that the United States brought to power. And uh, I mean, even Iranian senior Iranian ayatollahs gave fatwas that Iraqis should participate in a made in America election. Uh, but the, I think the Iranians would have assumed that at some point in time, Iraq would provide the strategic opening that David is talking about. But the, and, I, and at some point they even offered openly to talk to the, to the United States. And it's the only time that Iran's supreme leader publicly endorsed talking to the United States. But somehow, uh, Iraq has eluded you know, uh, the Iranians in some ways. And I think the, the problem Iran faces is not only Iraq didn't become a place where they would meet, it has now, as of January's the President's declaration, it has become a place where conflict between them has become more likely. In some ways, the new search strategy has really turned Iran's whole posture about on Iraq on its head. And uh, I think the Iranians still have to manage Iraq in the manner you said but not only in the sense of uh, you know, keeping the U.S. busy, but also in the sense of, uh, of, of trying to go back to a, to a point where the strategic common ground that they have in Iraq can provide the kind of opening that the nuclear issue or Lebanon and Hezbollah don't allow them, allow them to have. Okay, Ray, what would you say? Let me just uh, take the core of the question. Does Iran want America to remain bogged down to in Iraq because it detracts it. 
I've written this, so I might as well stay with it. I actually disagree with that at this point. Good. Uh, I think that at this juncture, Iranians want a departure of the American forces. Uh, That's certainly what they say. In, 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 well, I think in this case, what they say yeah. and what they mean are yep. peculiarly the same. Uh, <laughs> rarely, but uh, in that, to some extent, Iran's policy toward Iraq is one that is negotiated between they and Skiri in particular, Hakim's government. So in essence, they have Hakim's vision, namely a soft partition of Iraq with a departure of the American forces. That departure could be gradual because a precipitous departure could lead to its own set of this chaos and so forth. Uh, but if you look at what the Iranians are saying about Iraq, the sort of feasibility studies and so forth, they're looking essentially at economic integration of Iran, at least with the southern portion of Iraq, uh, beyond what Valley was mentioning in terms of trade. And they also seem to feel, if you look at some of the mediation diplomacy that they undertaken, that the regional states, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia in particular and Iran, can best mediate Iraq's civil war better than the Americans. And the American presence today is a source of division, instability, and divisiveness in Iraq. And the sooner Americans leave, the better Iraq civil wars can be tempered. Now, they may be wrong about those perceptions, but I think the sum total of Iranian policy today is the idea that America should leave. I don't think they think America needs to bleed more to detract it from its imperial ambition because they think the dog has so bled enough. It's so they, been they think enough. that we've been vaccinated. David, yeah. yes. Just a, a, a brief um, uh, uh, rejoinder, I guess, to, to, uh, to what Ray was saying. I think the, the one um, thing you can say that's po positive about President Bush's um, troop surge is that it confounded uh, expectations in Iran and I think in the region generally that America was so weakened by Iraq that President Bush was so weakened politically that basically you know we were we were on our way out that it was over and well wait a minute it isn't over the number of troops isn't coming down it's going up by 20,000 gee now it's 30,000 and so if you're sitting in Tehran there's a reason to take American power a little more seriously and for that reason um, to come to the, to the table in, in Baghdad, you, you could argue. I mean, certainly that mood of triumphalism of last September seems to have been changed somewhat if, if you read press accounts of the debate in Iran. Let's see what the, what the mullah says, and then we'll see what Valley uh, agree or disagree. Well, Steve, has this got your attention and made you a little more nervous? Uh, you want to keep the Americans bleeding, or you think they've had enough and settle? Uh, well, there's an extent to which uh, we, Iran, would see uh, Iraq as a large missed opportunity. Our mortal enemy was Saddam Hussein. This was the guy who inflicted a horrible war on us. Uh, and you Westerners didn't pay much attention, but this was for Iran, World War I and World War II put together. We lost half a million people. Our entire Western frontier was uh, annihilated. Uh, large portions of our country were occupied by Saddam for periods of time. They used weapons of mass destruction against us. So uh, we're, we were not at all unhappy to see Saddam Hussein eliminated. This is our number one security problem. The Americans took care of it. Uh, we're perfectly happy to see the Americans put Shiites in power uh, in Iraq. And in fact, you not only put Shiites in power, you haven't put the Shiites in power who are our particular friends. So we're not so unhappy about that, and this partly explains all these deals between Iran and the government uh, of Iraq. Uh, we'd be very happy to see this uh, Shiite-dominated government filled with our friends, stabilized and fully established, and were the United States and Iran working together, as we've attempted to do over the last several years, uh, perhaps we could have achieved this common aim. But. <laughs> Given that the intent of the American policy was to use Iraq against us, to use it as a way station on the road to regime change, it's been very helpful for us uh, that they got bogged down in a place that they didn't understand at all and that we understood much better. Well, you're, you're quick say, uh, in terms of Iran's calculation, we often don't take into account the, issue, the Kurdish issue for Iran and particularly the, the, pro, the prospect of a precipitous disintegration of Iraq, or even what nature soft partition might have, it's not just about the Shias in the south, it's also about what kind of a Kurdish entity 
emerges in the north. The other issue is that I think particularly now, Iran is looking at Iraq past the United States. And that's because Iraq has the potential of changing Iran's relations with all of its Arab neighbors. So the, the issue is not, it, it, say, if the United States left. I mean, this is a huge assumption on the part of the Iranians that they, the Saudis and the Jordanians and Egyptians, can actually come to an agreement on Iraq. If they cannot, then uh, Iraq can actually uh, make, it, make life in the region much more difficult for, for, for Iran, because Iran will be sucked in, into ultimately what would be a frontal conflict with its Arab neighbors. And uh, that goes against, if you would, a decade of Iranian investment in becoming much more re-engaged in the region and rebuilding its relations with the, with the Arab world. So I mean, in some ways, it's not just about us. We, at some points, we may be just sort of uh, just in the middle of it. But, but it, as Iranians always say, you know, the US ultimately will leave. Iran would have to live with this neighborhood. And I think that's the calculation that they would have to take into account. Let me do one more question, and then we're coming to the, to the audience, broadening, the, broadening the, the conversation as we get to the interests. And I think Steve Miller already uh, took us there. When we had uh, uh, former president, uh, former Iranian president Hatami here in uh, November or December, uh, I had opportunity to talk to him at some length. And I said, if I were uh, appointed the envoy for the Bush administration to Iran, which I assured him there was no chance of that occurring. But nonetheless, were I, I would go and try to see the Supreme Leader, uh, Khamenei, and I would say, I've come to collect. And this would take him a second to think about it. And then I would say, uh, who was your number one enemy in the world? Uh, Saddam. And who took him out? We did. Who was your number two enemy in the world? The Taliban, and who took them out? We did. Who was your number three enemy that you were most worried about? Osama and Al Qaeda, and who's been after them? Got them at least no longer sanctuaries in Afghanistan, which you used to be able to you have to tolerate. We did. Actually, and before that, who was your biggest fear in the world? The Soviet Union, and who took them out? We did. Okay. So you owe us. Uh, now, um, uh, Hatami said, well, actually, that's interesting. I've thought about this. Uh, that's what he said. He said, uh, uh, it is interesting, he, this is now Hatami, he said, it's interesting to me that the governments which you installed in the countries that were previously our biggest adversaries to the East and the West are more friendly with us than they are with any of your friends in the region. And actually, 24 of the 28 cabinet officers in Afghanistan were in Iran during the Taliban. And a substantial number of people who are now the government in Iraq were in Iran. So are these two nations that are destined to be adversaries, or is there some something in this coincidence of interest? Is it just, a, is it just an accident, or have we, failed to, have we failed to see something? Valley, you, you try to think hardest about this. What do, you, what do you think? I think it's an important point. I would say uh, the Iranians would say the same story you said, uh, slightly differently, saying that you, know, you removed Saddam Hussein, or all our friends came to power. You removed the Taliban, all our friends come to power. Anybody you remove, all our friends will come to power. <laughs> so you may as well agree that we matter from Central Asia to Lebanon, and that we are, in a, in a sense, uh, we are the great power in this region. And I think you know the, the issue. I mean, there are many people who argue that you know Iran has much more, America has much more natural affinity with Iran. I think a, an Iranian analyst said the same thing at Council on Foreign Relations, and he uh, decided to retract, fearing that he would there would be retribution. But I think the, the issue should be posed a little differently, is that it is also a decision on the part of the United States that does it want to commit itself to containing the largest, most populous uh, country in the region, the sort of a, a force that has these kinds of influences, and what, what degree of commitment and presence in the region would that require, um, even, if, even if these natural affinities didn't exist. 
I mean, ultimately, if America's Middle East policy becomes everything about Iran and about containing Iran, it would probably require a level of commitment to staying in the region that would be long run and beyond, I think, what the American people at this point in time are willing, willing to undertake. Ray, what would you, what would you say to this? Uh, if I were to ask the Supreme Leader that question, I would fear if his response was Israel, because I suspect we're not going to take that out for him. Uh, the U.S.-Iran relations are probably, in terms of assessment of it, I think it's fair to say the most unusual of all American relations, because they, they have oscillated between hysterical calls for war and sort of a remarkable rapture of reconciliation. Uh, they have been in these two extremes, play themselves out in that particular context. And I think what Valley was alluding to is that Iran, beyond the nuclear issue, which in some way is a wrong way, is a false prism of looking at the Iran's international relations. They see themselves as the preeminent regional power and that the United States should recognize and acknowledge that, and therefore have some sort of a relationship with it in that sense. I'm not quite sure if we're ready to make that sort of an accommodation with Iranian power in the critical waterways of the Middle East. Uh, so this is a relationship that is going to have certain structural tensions. Uh, as I always say, Iran is a problem to be managed. It could be managed better, or it could be managed worse. In the past 27 years, as Condoleezza Rice says, 27 years of mistakes. Now, six of them are hers. So it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a rather a remarkable acknowledgement. Uh, but nevertheless, I, as I said in the recent piece, I think it's possible to establish a framework where Iranian-American competition can be regulated, uh, can be modulated, and we need not between these two extremes. I don't anticipate U.S.-Iranian alliance, but I also don't think we need to anticipate a U.S.-Iranian war. It's going to be somewhere in the middle, a prickly problematic country, not unlike China, not unlike other aspiring regional powers with which we deal with. David, what would you say? Natural adversaries or potential uh, alignment? I, I, I don't think we know yet, but I think that, that that's the really the, the heart of the matter that needs to be explored in a, a, a serious high-level dialogue. I mean, if the Cuban Missile Crisis is the paradigm for confrontation in, the, in most of our lifetimes, uh, Kissinger's and Nixon's opening to China is the paradigm of, of diplomacy. Mm -hmm. And um, I've, I've asked Kissinger, um, and I've also read as many of his uh, memcons, um, from his conversations with Joanne Lai in the period of opening. I commend them to this audience. They're available at the National Security Archive and they're extraordinary reading. Um, but, you know, what is the lesson of, of that diplomacy? And he would say, and, and the documentation from what he did illustrates that, um, in essence, this is a conversation about what are our interests fundamentally what are Iran's interests fundamentally, and how do they intersect? And they obviously intersect in Iraq in the ways that we've discussed, and they intersect in some other ways in terms of orderly commerce in the Gulf and uh, Iran's uh, entry into full participation in, in, in the global economy. There are other ways in which they, 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 they are clearly in contradiction. We strongly support Israel. Iran strongly opposes Israel. So that, that discussion clarifies, you know, what our mutual interests are and how to build on them, what our areas of difference are, how to, how to, how to, how to address those. And then finally, I think in this conversation, we have to make clear to Iran what our red lines are. You know, I think that's part of taking Iran seriously, is to say honestly, at, at the highest level, privately, not in you know, a rhetorical speech, but privately, intimately, this is what is unacceptable to us. You have to understand that. Okay. So, Mula Miller, we gave you the last uh, comment on this one. You, you, uh, you think these Americans are destined to be your adversary, or do you think they just haven't awakened to the fact that your their interests are aligned, or you think you're doing fine? Uh, well, your earlier comments uh, suggested the array of common interests that we might have been able to build a more constructive relationship upon, 
And to be candid, we had some economic incentives for wanting to reach out to the West, gain investment in our energy sector, uh, and so on. And in fact, if you come to Tehran, you will discover that analyst after analyst explains, to, Iranian analyst after Iranian analyst, explains to you that for the last 10 years, we've made overture after overture to the United States, uh, trying to uh, reconfigure uh, this relationship. Now, of course, we disagree on some issues, and no two states ever uh, fully agree. We thought that Bush was a big opportunity because we had very frustrating experiences with Clinton. And we thought 9-11 pushed the door open. Uh, we condemned the attack at the highest level of our government. Uh, we offered immediate condolences. Uh, and more importantly, we offered to cooperate. And we provided material cooperation in the war against Taliban. We got formal expressions of thanks from the Bush administration for our assistance in the campaign in the fall of 2001. And we thought we had begun to make a beginning of repositioning this relationship. So we couldn't have been more shocked by the axis of evil speech. And this uh, did, in fact, shake things up in Tehran and undercut those who were advocating this move, this sort of detente with the United States. Uh, however, even after that, we've made several dramatic gestures, including in May of 2003, uh, the offer to discuss some sort of grand bargain. We've gotten very little uh, traction in this. And the growing feeling in in uh, our foreign policy community is that the Western strategy has failed and that we need to turn eastwards. And we've been very successful in recent times uh, in forging particularly a relationship with China, particularly over energy, involving uh, well over $100 billion of eco economic activity recently and uh, more to come with Russia and with India. Uh, and so we don't feel isolated. We don't feel contained. We don't feel trapped. Uh, we'd rather that our Western strategy succeeded, but we, at least the majority in our crowd now, seems to think that it's a fruitless enterprise. But a lost opportunity because we had a lot of common interests. Uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda, energy, and we also think stability in the Gulf, which is in our interest, it's in your interest, and we could work together on it if America was only prepared to acknowledge our central role, which they're not. Okay, uh, the, uh, we're now come to the opportunity for people to ask questions. As you're lining up at the microphones, we're going to show you a clip from Mr. Uh, or President Hatami, if, if it works, uh, in which he basically uh, offered here in the forum a view that was very close to Mr. Miller's. So I would say, let's see what we have here. But there are microphones on the ground floor the last and at the first lodges. Amongst the hospitable American people have coincided with the fifth anniversary of tragic events of September 11th. These troubled times have seen their fair share of calamities, but the horrific terror unleashed on the Tuesday in September will no doubt come to be known as one of the greatest of the calamities. I, want one of, I was one of the first world leaders to condemn this barbaric and savage act as a human, as a Muslim, and as an Iranian, I stand before you to once again express my deepest sympathy with the families of the victims and with all the great American people. Let us wish for a world devoid of violence and anger and instead blessed with compassion and peace. Thank you very much. That's also an advertisement for the Institute of Politics if you go to their website, they've put all of the forums uh, on a digital form so you can go back and look at them. So uh, be welcome to that. And that was a very, very interesting forum. Let me go here. Introduce yourself. Short question or short uh, comment, please. Hi, I'm Will Rubin, a freshman at the college here. And thank you very much for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, my question goes back to a topic that uh, was mentioned but not really discussed earlier about the prospects of uh, governmental change in Iran. 
Uh, I'm wondering what you all believe the prospects of, of that change would be. Um, I know we've seen some protests at uh, universities, but very sparse uh, in terms of uh, uh, an uprising conflict there. Um, and how would that uh, governmental change impact the, uh, the potential for conflict or cooperation with, between Iran and the U.S.? Good question. Maybe Valley, do you want to take a shot at that? I would not say that there's any prospect for immediate regime change in Iran without uh, possibility of a ser serious external pressure on Iran. And uh, we sort of get uh, very hopeful in slightest signs of dissent in Iran. But uh, the Iranian regime, much like mo most other Middle Eastern regime, is perfectly capable of, of handling these pressures. Secondly, it, it has m means of calibrating power internally through elections uh, and the like. I think, in fact, in some ways, you have a stable authoritarian regime in Iran. That's not to say that there is no pro-democracy uh, sentiment in Iran. It's actually very, very strong. But there is no really organized democracy movement that could actually move this, this forward. And it's in its absence. I don't see anything happening in the near future. If anybody disagrees, say so. Otherwise, we'll move on. Yep. Good. In the, in the lodge. All right. Um, my name is Tufik Rahim. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School at least until my stats midterm on Tuesday. Um, until what? Uh, my statistics midterm. OK, good, <laughs> good. Um, <clears throat> uh, I liked, I uh, appreciated uh, Steve Miller's perspective. Uh, just let me first say that uh, it'd be nice here at the Kennedy School on CNN, the US government, to have more Iranian perspectives. And I think that dialogue would uh, help this entire process. Steve uh, is for rent, so if you uh, <laughs> Uh, let me just ask, um, what are your thoughts about the wider Sunni-Shiite conflict in the region? Um, with the you know, increasing U.S. pressure and kind of this um, uh, positioning vis-a-vis -vis Iran and the U.S. and vice versa, uh, what do you think the consequences are going to be in the region with this now emerging Sunni alliance, you know, spe speaking of the Shiite crescent and you know, from Saudi Arabia, you know, meetings prop, uh, perhaps between uh, Israeli representatives and Saudi representatives. Do you see a greater conflagration of the Shiite Sunni uh, conflict in the region? And what do you think um, the extent of that may or may not be? As I said in the introduction, there's a terrific book on this subject uh, uh, written by Vali Nasser. He's not going to give you a summary, but Vali, why don't you take an initial revival? shot at that too, Is that please? The one? It's a very I, good question. Yeah. I think, it, 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 not to say that there'd be a, a, a major blow up, but I think the issue will matter for, for a while to come for three simple reasons. One is that I think Iraq is still capable of, uh, uh, of producing, as we've seen in the past few days alone, of producing more horrific uh, uh, violent outcomes that is, li is likely to at least deepen the uh, divide in the public arena. Secondly, there is potential, particularly in Lebanon, for some kind of a um, conflict that if it happens, obviously, would deepen this issue. But I think thirdly is the, is the issue that you raised, that since uh, the summer war in Lebanon, there is a, uh, a consensus, if you would, within Arab regimes to use the sectarian issue as a way of containing Iran. And that's very different from in Iraq. In other words, it's not coming from below. It's sectarianism being pushed on the region uh, from above. And if, this, if the United States particularly uh, sort of take sides on this and, and it itself adopts a sectarian foreign policy by embracing the foreign policy of the Arab governments essentially as US foreign policy, it will entrench much more deeply this, this uh, sectarian divide within the region. And then it's likely to play itself out in every other arena in which uh, disagreement and rivalry occurs. David, you want to? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to agree with the, the last part of what, uh, what Vali said. and, and uh, Put it, put it this way, I don't know that we can stop the civil war between Sunni and Shia in Iraq. It, it, I think it's unlikely that we can stop it. And um, the killing, unfortunately, will continue. So the task for US policy is to contain the civil war within Iraq and to keep it from spreading more broadly in the Middle East, to keep this, this fault line from just ripping across uh, that whole part of the world. And I, I think the administration, Secretary of State Rice, made a, a fundamental mistake in seeming to encourage um, Sunni uh, alliance against, against Iran and against militant 
uh, Shiism, um, and I hope that they backed away from that, uh, because that would have the effect of I th fear of, of, of making that civil war region-wide. Well, there's, a, there's a piece in the current New Yorker by uh, Cy Hirsch on this, which is basically an expansion of the Jim Dobbins rather troubling op-ed that was in the International Herald Tribune in January, saying that, in fact, Dobbins, who's a very, very balanced person, arguing that the U.S. is now supporting Sunni anti-Shiite militias across the region, including in uh, Palestine and uh, Lebanon. So that's just, just for your reading pleasure, but we're up here at the Lodge, please. Uh, hello, my name is Chris Ramsenpour, and I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. Um, you guys, you spoke of some of the players, some of the other players in the, 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 the regional conflict, and you kind of talked around Israel's role in uh, reaching some sort of uh, settlement on the nuclear issue. Uh, were the United States and Iran to come to some terms of agreement on the, the nuclear issue within Iran, how willing do you think Israel would be to abide by a similar uh, terms of agreement in light of what Ahmadinejad uh, s had said last year about the destruction of Israel. I, Please. Uh, yeah. Actually, despite much that is said, Israelis are eminently pragmatic, particularly in, in terms of their foreign policy, you may see even immoral in terms of their approach to their regional affairs. Uh, and I do believe they sincerely want this issue to be resolved through some sort of a negotiations, if at all possible. So if there is some sort of a diplomatic breakthrough that limits the scope and extent of Iran's nuclear program, then I suspect they're likely to come around to it. Uh, I don't see a sort of a lust in Israel for militarily resolving this issue because they understand the impracticality of that. So any disagreement? Okay. Chuck, please. Introduce yourself, too. Chuck Kogan, uh, Belfast Center. A couple of days ago, uh, Hashemi Rafsanjani made a statement to the effect that the two interventions of the U.S. in Afghanistan and Iraq had been to the strategic advantage of Iran. Now, he didn't express any gratitude for that. He said that made the U.S. all the more dangerous. Uh, my past experience indicates that Iranians are masters of indirect discourse. Uh, what is Rafsanjani getting at in this and other recent statements, and in view of his now strengthened position in Iran, uh, what's your assessment of his role as a possible, well, replacement for Ahmadinejad? Who's been following uh, the politics close? Uh, <laughs> you two guys watch it every, every hour, yes? Uh, <coughs> I actually take the view that what we're seeing in Iran today is a generational succession. Uh, not, not unusual for a regime that's been around for 27, 28 years. We are accustomed to thinking of Iranian politics in terms of Hash, Rafsanjani, Khamenei, and so forth. But I think we need to pay attention to the second generation of leaders that are coming to the power. And I tried to sort of elucidate some of them. Uh, I don't see uh, Rafsanjani coming back into that sort of an executive elected office that you're talking about. And I'm not quite sure if some of the position he's been given have strengthened his posture. Uh, but there is a tendency within Iran that accepts the fact that the rise of Iran can come about through some sort of an accommodation with the United States. Uh, because America is still a powerful state and it can certainly obstruct the trajectory of Iranian power and therefore some sort of an accommodation is best way of approaching it, or even some sort of a rationalization of that relationship. That is evident in some of the second generation of leaders, and one can look into that. But in terms of specifically your question about Rafsanjani's role, I would suggest that you know, Iran is moving beyond the first generation of leaders, and we need to look at the second one. If you need disagree, say, please. Hello, my name is Ashley Stover. I'm a second year uh, master's degree student here at Kennedy School. Um, I wanted to come back to the mention of red lines and American credibility when we're at the negotiation table. Um, over the past six years, we've, in many different situations and with Iranians, we've put out red lines that you can't do this, we don't want you to do this. 
So even if our if we have some interests that are aligned, if there is something in between being full diplomatic relations and attack or at war, if we're going to the bargaining table with people who don't really think that our, credi our credibility is lacking, we really don't have a red line. There's a red line to always step over. How is it that you can get to this point where you can have some kind of structural relationship that you were talking about earlier if the US, in Iranian eyes, and correct me if I'm wrong, is lacking that type of credibility to say, don't push us farther. Well, maybe this is a good one for Mullah, uh, Miller here. Does, does the US lack credibility in Iranians' eyes so that if we were to draw some red lines, you don't believe it? Well, we have some good friends in Moscow and Beijing who often whisper things to us that are quite reassuring. And uh, we've noticed the difficulty the Americans have had in configuring even rather limited uh, sanctions. We're not pleased by those sanctions, but they're not terribly biting. And in, in the middle of those uh, sanctions discussions, we had uh, the beginnings of deliveries of uh, air defense equipment from Russia. Uh, in the middle of these discussions, we signed a $100 billion energy development deal with the Chinese. These were slight hints to us that there were parties that were prepared to uh, deal with us, e even as the Americans were trying uh, to isolate us. So the question is, what can the Americans do to enforce these red lines, uh, given that what they're trying to do is force us, because they don't like it, to cease uh, the pursuit of legal permitted activities? And uh, go back to the last NPT review conference. The world community at the 2005 NPT review conference, they supported us. The Americans were hoping to use that as, a, as an occasion to corner us and trap us and coerce us into concessions. And in fact, the non-aligned movement, 114 states, issued a communique supporting the position of, of Iran. Look at this, the positions of key third world countries. Uh, they're just as worried about their Article 4 rights as we are. Mexico, Egypt, uh, even countries we don't have particularly close relationships with basically back us on this one. So that makes it, from our point of view, very hard for uh, the Americans to push us around too much. On the other hand, we're, we've, the, the position has always been we're prepared to negotiate. We're just not prepared to make our massive concession as the first step before the Americans will talk to us. David, in your conversations there, did you feel an absence of credibility for the Americans or the Bush administration? And is, would that be a, a, a uh, overwhelming, uh, is that an overwhelming obstacle? Um, I, I did think that there, that there was a lack of credibility to U.S. power. Um, Iranians uh, in August and September simply didn't take uh, our, our threats seriously. Um, you know, they thought um, that we wouldn't attack them, that it would, it would be irrational to do that. But even if, if we did, it would, it would hurt us hurt the United States more than it would hurt them. Um, in terms of reestablishing some credibility so that we can be an effective uh, uh, negotiator or even, even eventually partner, um, two things. I mean, I, I said earlier that this is the, the one um, benefit that I see of, of the troop surge is that it, it does show that we're not cornered, that our president can still take decisive action even if he has very little popularity or congressional support. The second, and really this is the most important, we haven't talked about it much except um, the, the, the mullet to my left just, just mentioned it. Um, and, that, and that is um, the role of, of the Soviet Union and uh, Russia and, and China, especially Russia. If you asked Iranians last year um, you know, how things were going to play out, they'd say, well, you know, the Americans will try to go to the UN for sanctions, but the Russians will support us. And they just took that as a matter of course, much as, much as, as was just stated. And guess what? Um, the Russians haven't supported Iran. The Russians, in fact, have been part of a surprisingly cohesive coalition, sending a very clear, increasingly clear message um, to, to Iran. The Russians supported the, the first UN resolution, which passed unanimously. They have signaled this week um, to uh, the Secretary of State that they will support a prompt second resolution that will be passed, I think, this month um, uh, that, will, that will slightly ratchet up the sanctions. So 
in terms of having um, a coherent um, stance to, toward, toward the Iranians, I think the most important thing is our ability to mobilize this coalition. As long as it stays intact, I think Iran will feel isolated. They don't like that. I think that's the biggest factor in changing their behavior. Okay. It is true that, that we've been somewhat disappointed with certain aspects of Russian policy. Uh, however, two weeks ago, we had the Russian Ministry of Atomic Power in Tehran. He had his sales brochures with him. Uh, we've, we've been deep into negotiations with the Russians uh, for a second reactor. They finished the first one for us at Boucher. In due course, when things calm down, we'll have a second reactor. It will be built by the Russians. We're absolutely convinced of that. Uh, so uh, we're in the midst of establishing a long-term uh, and capital-intensive energy relationship with China. This has been almost untouched by the recent sanctions issues. Uh, we, we have now major deals with both of the largest Chinese energy companies. So uh, it's at most a mixed picture here and one that we can live with. Fairly quick one, and then we're going to take three quick questions and three quick answers. Yep, good. Well, I, I fully agree. I mean, this, the issue of credibility, there are two credibility issues. One is the one that uh, both Steve and David mentioned, namely U.S. power is not taken seriously. The other credibility issue is that, the, that U.S. power does not mean what it says. In other words, when, when we say uh, that you, don't, you shouldn't have centrifuges, we don't mean centrifuges, we mean regime change. Uh, and I think, you know, Ray has um, uh, given very colorful examples of this in, in his article in, in Foreign Affairs. So, so, I mean, there are two different credibility issues. Okay. Is that what, when we say something, we don't mean it. And then when we mean it, they don't, we don't, we're not taking it seriously we can't, we, because we can't enforce it. Ray, you want to do one line on that one? My favorite is Amelie Nijal's line when he says if, uh, I think I cited it in the piece as well, if we give in on the nuclear issue, they'll ask for human rights. If we give in on human rights, they'll ask for animal rights. So. <laughs> <laughs> OK, no we're end. up here for short questions and short answers, please. Hi, my name is Rene Skoll. I'm a student at the business school. I'm a little bit humored that we're treating Iran as a rational state. You know, the president has you know, denied the Holocaust, threatened to wipe Israel, threatened Europe, threatened the US, trying to topple the government of Lebanon. With that in mind, you know, how do you see the, con you know, the consequences in the regional if Iran does develop a nuclear weapon? And what consequences would that have? Who wants to take a short on that? Uh, the consequences of Iran having a nuclear weapon. I used to think that actually it wouldn't lead to a sort of a cascade in terms of other regional powers acquiring or aspiring to similar capability. I still think so in terms of Jordan and Egypt because they have important relationships with the United States and important relationship with Israel. I'm less sanguine about the possibilities of some of the Gulf states, particularly Saudi Arabians, which may feel vulnerable to Iran attempting to acquire their own indigenous capability, whether it's Saudi case through Pakistan or attempting to build their own or what have you. So, and at the very least, I think it will introduce a conventional arms race in the region. And at the time when regional states should spend their money on their domestic economic needs, their demographic challenges, and economic imbalance between classes, uh, that would be a wrong way of spending money. And I fear if Iran develops a nuclear capability, that sort of an arms race is something that the United States would encourage. Uh, and you have seen indications of that over the past years, uh, which would be fundamentally debilitating to the region as a whole. Uh, let me just put, uh, not that I disagree, I, but the different scenario. One is that even if there is a nuclear race in the region, regardless of who gets the nukes, they all will be pointed towards Israel, end of the day. So ultimately, you know, this is opening a door for escalation of uh, military tensions with Israel. I, I, I actually have to disagree with Valley. Good, this. good. <laughs> we learn more from disagreements because, and agreements, because, so please. In the past 50 years, the Arab states have lost four wars to Israel, 50, 48, 56, 67, 73, four, Lebanon maybe. And they have never talked about actually having a nuclear capability. As soon as Iranians assembled four centrifuges with scotch tape and rubber band, they're all talking about having a nuclear capability, which leads me to believe that despite the rhetoric, deep, deep inside, the Arab states are, have always, the Arab political leadership has always been more concerned with Iran than with Israel. Well, uh, no, I don't, uh, uh, unless you think that Iran provides both the perfect excuse to be able to maintain your close relations with the U.S. 
and Israel and also get, at least get on the first rung of the ladder. And secondly, Iran is charting a path within NPT to get one screwdriver short of a bomb, which is what they would want to be able to do as well. But just to follow up on, on that, there's, there's obviously two models out there. Namely, I don't believe there'd be a nuclear war. I mean, look at India and Pakistan. Hardly two countries hated each other more. And as soon as they both went nuclear, there's no more war. But there are two models there. One is India got the bomb and settled down and became a, a, a sort of a status quo state. Pakistan has been misbehaving far more since it got the bomb because it believes there will not be war. So the question is, which will Iran be? Uh, even if you put the Arab countries aside, is Iran likely to become more like India, settle down and behave differently, or that you know, it can encourage Hezbollah to lob uh, you know, rockets into Israel on a weekly basis, believing that there will not be any consequence, the way that the Pakistanis you know, support the Kashmir Jihad you know, with complete carefree attitude, and you know, the president can come here to the forum and you know, uh, not worry. Uh, <laughs> Okay, Mullah Miller wants a quick comment, and then we got just two last questions, please. Just one sentence about the, the premise of your question, which is, we see ourselves as pragmatic, and the big problem in the world is the radical, irrational, ideological policies of the United States. Yes. Uh, my name is Jonathan Mitchell. I'm a oh. second year MPP student here at the Kennedy School. And um, my question is specifically about um, Iran's nuclear program. And uh, we read a lot about different carrots and sticks, which might be the most effective way to get the Iranian regime to really reconsider this program. Um, if you were advising the United States government on specific carrots and sticks, sanctions, different kinds of inducements, uh, what do you think would be the most effective to get them to at least first suspend enrichment and then um, cooperate uh, at a certain level with the IAEA um, to come to a certain level of transparency that would allay the West fears about this program. Okay, good. Who wants that one? Uh, here's what I would say regarding current U.S. policy, which is essentially, as I think David alluded to, it is a dual track policy. On the one hand, you augment pressure against Iran, whether to naval deployments through various informal sanctions and various United Nations resolution. Yet, on the other hand, you suggest to the Iranians that we are prepared to negotiate. And the idea of being one track uh, reinforces the other. I actually think that contradiction bedevils American foreign policy in this respect. I must, confuse, I must con confess to some degree of confusion. Uh, Secretary Rice talks about potential resumption of trade. Bob Kimmett is in Europe trying to restrict trade to Iran. Uh, Sean McCormick, the spokesperson with Rice, is talking about potential bilateral meetings. Tony Snow is suggesting they're not. I don't even understand it, and I live here. Uh, I think given the factional nature of the Iranian political system, and given their deep suspicion of the United States, and their perception that much of American policy is dedicated to regime change, such confusion in this factional political system has created paralysis. That's why it took Iranians so long to respond to being participant in the Iraqi conference, which originally was their idea. So you go one way or you go the other. Now, David mentioned the case of Sino-American normalization, and historical analogies are imperfect, but let's take that one as a, as a case in point. Between the years 1969 to 1971, uh, the United States does several things. It reduces provocative naval maneuvers in Taiwan Strait. It unilaterally lifts all trade and tourism restrictions. Uh, and third, changes the content of American public diplomacy. Richard Nixon talking about People's Republic of China with respect, and the content of VOA broadcasts. And there is no Chinese response to that from 69 to 1971, 71 ping pong and so forth. So it took two years of unilateral American gestures to essentially prove goodwill to a fundamentally suspicious revolutionary regime. The dual track policy, I think, is not going to work because one track negates the impact of the other track. I mean, you go containment and isolation or engagement, which requires some degree of obsequiousness, and no one was more obsequious toward the Chinese than Henry Kissinger. Uh, <laughs> I mean, one, wait till those records come out. <laughs> OK, David, last, on this point, and then we have this last question. Um, I, I agree about the obsequiousness issue. Um, the, Khomeini um, once said uh, uh, about America uh, back during the, uh, the uh, uh, hostage crisis, I think, America can't do a damn thing. And that uh, phrase is often repeated by Iranians you know, as an expression of their belief that 
you know, fundamentally we may huff and puff, but we, we really are, are not all, all, that, all that powerful. And, and I think that um, that certainly applied to sanctions, which Iranians dismissed to me. And uh, one surprise has been that sanctions today, uh, because really because of the way in which the international financial system is interwoven, U.S. Um, uh, banking sanctions have the effect of really cutting a country off from a lot of international, the, the way the international financial system works. That's had more attention, uh, effect on Iran than they expected. It's gotten their attention. I was just talking to some businessmen from Tehran last week who were talking about the ways in which they're having to adjust uh, how they're doing business. They don't like it. It certainly has, has reduced investment they need in their, in their oil sector um, at a time when that's crucial for Iran. So I, I, I think you know, it is getting their attention. I disagree with you. It may, it may be a mixed message, but, but, uh, but so what? It does counter this notion that we can't do a damn thing because we can do something. If I just make one small uh, footnote, uh, Henry Kissinger was my professor a long time ago, and I would say that obsequiousness in pursuit of virtue is no <laughs> vice. So uh, uh, here, here we are to the last question, please. I'm here at Cambodia, and I'm a second year uh, master's in public policy student here at the Kennedy School. Um, my question sort of uh, jumps off of what you just said. Um, when you look at the United States government message, it's um, civil nuclear power, yes, weapons, no. This message does not seem to be getting through to the Iranian public, basically because the IRI depicts it as denial. Um, what can we do to get a message through to the Iranian people? And is it even worth trying? Because I've read some things that say we shouldn't, we don't even know if they'll believe us. Um, and would a good first step be um, something such as lifting the ban on US government officials being allowed to even speak on Persian satellite television and other such things? I think U.S. government officials are going on satellite televisions, uh, uh, VOAs and others, sort of a you know, radio fire. I meant also. their state television. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not quite sure if that's... Uh, on the nuclear issue, there's been all kinds of discussion whether the Iranian public supports it or they don't support it. Uh, at the end of the day, I don't think that's particularly a relevant question. Because at the end of the day, this is an elite decision, an elite determination about what kind of a nuclear program they can have and should have or want to have. And that's not peculiar to Iran, that in many ways, decisions regarding nuclear strategy in all countries, even democratic countries, are made by a narrow sector of elite. In summer of 2001, the Bush administration decided to negate and get out of the, uh, this, one of the arms control agreements with the Soviet Union, the, uh, the ABM treaty. I don't remember anybody asking my opinion. Uh, it was a decision made at high level in consultation with some members of Congress. So the Iranian nuclear program is the subject of preview by a very limited sector of people. And I don't think to acceleration of public pressure and so on, you can affect that. They're trying to stimulate their public to get behind it by issuing a stamp the other day. The new currency that's coming around is supposed to have a nuclear emblem on it. I don't know the effectiveness of those on Iranian public opinion, frankly. A uh, greater degree of public diplomacy, I think that presupposes the, the idea that Iranian people don't have access to information. And in the age of global media, I, don't, I just can't buy that. Uh, I mean, I can Persian the third, fourth language on the internet and so forth and have a lot of ways of access. So I'm not quite sure the problem with the Iranian public not backing or backing American policy is the lack of information. Okay. David, do you want to say anything on that? On the communication issue? Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, the Iranian uh, blogosphere is one of the most active in the world. Um, if you want to get a, a flavor of it, I'm, I'm sure you have ways, but we have a website at the Washington Post called Post Global, which samples a little bit of this Iranian discussion. I think our government's notion that we have to pump money in and you know, create a program, I think it just, as, as Ray was suggesting, it just insults people. Um, you know, we need as, as open an exchange of, of information as possible, but, but I think that's enough. Just let that, let that wind blow. The, the United States openly and explicitly pursues a policy of regime change. It spends $100 million a year trying to undermine our country. Uh, it supports a terrorist group, MEK, which is uh, actively working against the interests of the state of Iran. Uh, you have explicit threats against us when you went into Iraq. Uh, you have an open debate in your neoconservative community about the wisdom of attacking uh, Iran. Uh, and 
At the same time, we're to believe that you're interested in a deal that will provide genuine benefits to Iran. Very difficult, after all this time, to persuade us of the genuineness of your interest in a deal. Uh, and indeed, there are big voices in our country who believe that anything that is acceptable to the United States in the negotiating context is, in fact, a subset of your regime change policy and therefore ought to be viewed with great suspicion uh, by Iran. So in that sense, the, the difficulty of managing the carrots and sticks uh, is quite tough because your sticks have been brandished so extensively that we have very great difficulty accepting the credibility of your carrots. I'd also like to add one quick point, which is uh, Iran's facilities are governed by, its nuclear facilities are governed by a safeguards agreement. Uh, our current activities are in good standing. That is to say, they're regularly inspected by the IAEA. Uh, we've signed the additional protocol, which more than half of the members of the NPT regime have not done. For three years, we allowed the, the additional protocol to be implemented, though our modulus had not yet ratified it. We further negotiated additional transparency measures uh, with the IAEA, permitting, for example, some limited inspection of uh, military bases, which is not required by the MPT regime or by our safeguards uh, agreement. Uh, we've offered joint equity positions to external parties at various times, the offers never taken up. Uh, uh, Mr. Rouhani, when he was our national security advisor, expressed an interest in negotiating bilateral transparency measures with uh, with uh, the EU that might be more intrusive than is the case of the IAEA inspection regime. Uh, these offers have not been picked up. And the question is, what more are we supposed to do to assure the world? I keep hearing that we need to establish more transparency. What, what do you want? I, I think, Steve, before you persuade us, I'm going to have to call this to a conclusion. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be in trouble. Let me uh, say uh, in closing, uh, Steve Miller uh, appeared uh, in this uh, role playing and with no intent for any disrespect for anybody, but because one of the best ways to try to think about a problem and one that Americans, like me, have so much trouble doing is looking at something through somebody else's eyes. And I think uh, for a fantastic panel tonight, uh, and for the guests that came, and for our local bullet, let's say thank you very much. Good. Good. That was fun. <laughs>